Hello, everyone. My name is Ida Cutler. I'm a can everybody can y'all mute yourselves? Um, just if you put your cursor over your face and then you'll say toggle mic and then you'll just click that and then that should make the echo go away. Sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. I don't know why. Cool. Cool. I'm going to go for it. A little bit of an echo still. Everyone, are you on mute? Here, oh, I can do it for you. I forgot. I got it. You're good. Okay. I'll bring you back when you need to speak again. I don't know why. Sometimes crowdcast everyone. Um, all right. Well, where was I? I'm Ida Cutler. I'm a bookseller at Women and Children First. We are one of the last remaining feminist bookstores in the United States. We're honored to celebrate the release of Open by Rachel Krantz, and we're thrilled, thrilled to have Jessica Fern join us for this conversation. We would like to begin our virtual events as we begin our events held in the store with a land acknowledgement. Please join me in acknowledging that the land on which the bookstore stands is the unceded territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, and Miami people. There are over 75,000 indigenous people living in Illinois, and we strive to recognize and honor native literature and communities. We encourage you to learn more about land acknowledgements and the rightful owners of the land where you are viewing tonight's event. Going beyond land acknowledgement to the work on the ground, we also encourage folks to research their local indigenous-led land back organizations. For us here in Chicago, we uplift the ongoing work of the American Indian Center of Chicago. Women and Children First is open for in-store browsing Tuesday through Sunday, 11 to 6. We continue to offer curbside pickup and we ship anywhere in the U.S. All of our upcoming events are going to be virtual. The next one that we have coming up is The Sex Lives of African Women by Nana Darkoa Sekiyama, and they will be in conversation with Charlene Carruthers on Friday, March 25th at 12.30 p.m. You can find out more about our future events on our website, womenandchildrenfirst.com. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. Be, for, be sure to drop, drop your questions by clicking that ask a question button you see below the screen and we will get to them at the end of the discussion. Throughout the event, you can also click the buy the book button if you have yet to do so. Uh, on to our intros for our authors that we have here. Rachel Krantz is a journalist and one of the founding editors of Bustle where she served as senior features editor for three years. Her work has been featured on NPR, The Guardian, Vox, Vice, and many other outlets. She is the recipient of the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award, the Investigative Reporters and Editors Radio Award, the Edward R. Murrow Award, and the Peabody Award for her work as an investigative reporter with YR Media. Open is her first book. Jessica Fern is a psychotherapist, certified clinical trauma professional, and author of the book Polysecure, attachment, trauma, and non-monogamy. In her international private practice, Jessica works with individuals, couples, and people in multiple partner relationships who no longer want to be limited by their reactive patterns, cultural conditioning, insecure attachment styles, and past traumas, helping them to embody new possibilities in life, in life and love. Please join me in welcoming our two authors. I greatly look forward to this conversation. Um, I'm going to read just a little bit since part of what Jessica and I will be talking about is jealousy and really focusing on some of the psychology behind this story. Um, a little bit from the chapter uh, where I'm adjusting to Adam, my uh, primary partner, dating someone else for the first time. And at this point in the story, um, we're a little over a year into our relationship. He's been monogamous the whole time, but I have been having experiences with him with other people. But this is the first time he's having um, experiences apart and I am really struggling with jealousy. Jealousy is made all the more infuriating by how you watch it invite exactly what you're trying to prevent. I could see logically that my grotesque insecurity was extremely unattractive and risked making Adam grow tired of me more than his dating someone else. Yes, I could see that quite clearly. I was filled with self-aversion at my apparently threadbare self-esteem. 
why can't I just get a handle on myself? The thing we initially value most about our relationship is often the very same thing we fear losing most and therefore feel most jealous over. During this initial transition, the partner who is feeling demoted often reports experiencing sadness, betrayal, distrust, a sense of loss and grieving, and fear of abandonment, Kathy Labriola wrote of my current state. The other partner often makes the situation worse by denying that there is any loss, ridiculing or dismissing their partner's fears, and stressing that this new development will enhance the primary relationship. It is bound to backfire by making the partner feel invalidated. Instead, it is important to acknowledge that their partner has lost something. They have lost the primacy of being the one and only lover. I underlined that last line several times. This is exactly what Adam won't acknowledge, asshole. Adam kept saying I was making things harder than they had to be. He reminded me that if I looked at it logically, I'd see that nothing about his behavior or feelings toward me had actually changed. Anyone else would be a romantic friendship at most about a desire that wasn't even really about sex or love, he explained. It was more his curiosity about, curiosity about life, a desire to access the intimacy only romance affords you. Intimacy meant stories, understanding the human experience so that he could better write and teach about it. This desire for continued romantic inspiration I related to and didn't want to deny him. But despite what had happened with Liam, Adam couldn't empathize with or even admit to understanding my jealousy. That he presented himself as above these feelings reinforced the idea that he was the more mature and enlightened one in our relationship. Suited to non-monogamy, it becomes synonymous with positive traits, struggling with jealousy, with immaturity and pettiness. What Adam wants and ethical non-monogamy goals had become conflated as one and the same in my mind. All right, and I'll just stop there. So we have lots to talk about and I want us to have enough time to do that. That's great. It's echo tolerable. It is for me, so we'll just keep going. Okay. We'll go for <laughs> Hard for me. For <laughs> Lean in. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'm looking at all my questions that I have for you. So you say at the end of the book, um, the very end, no spoilers here though, just not knowing if you had what it took to share this story. And yet here you were, years of video, uh, audio recording, transcripts that you've been taking, right? How did you have the foresight to document all of this? Would be like part one. And then, you know, how, how did you come to what it took to share this story? Yeah, thanks. Well, um, the foresight was a mix of factors. One was that was how I was used to kind of living at that point because I was working as an editor at Bustle, doing a lot of uh, quick personal essays and rapidly digesting experiences to write about them. So I was kind of already processing things that way. Then an agent approached me when I had just started writing about being in a non-monogamous relationship saying you should write a book about this. I haven't seen something that's really journalistic and memoir of someone who's actually living this. And I said, yeah, sure. But, you know, like I'm literally sick to my stomach and feel quite bad at this. And everything I had read about non-monogamy was people who were doing it well. And I felt like I was not. And I was also really not sure if this was going to continue to be for me. Um, but she said, well, just start writing things down. And that kind of like watered the seed that I'd already had in my mind. Of, of course, I thought it was interesting and, and thought maybe one day I'll write about this when I figure out, you know, what it means to me. I'd already been keeping a journal. Um, and I started then viewing things more as potentially one day, this is the light at the end of the jealousy tunnel. Perhaps one day I'll write a book about it. And then it developed into a very elaborate coping mechanism, especially mm -hmm. as things between Adam and I began to get more and more unhealthy and there was more and more gaslighting. And he was saying things to me all the time of, you're remembering things wrong, or, you know, I didn't say that, or deeming my feelings not true or saying I was misinterpreting reality. I was like, well, can I record 
our conversations then since I seem to have so much trouble remembering what's actually happening. And to his credit, he let me. Um, and so the recording became its own coping mechanism of feeling like as these conversations were getting increasingly distressing, as I felt eventually like I was losing my own sanity and sense of judgment or ability to perceive reality and had someone who was continually telling me it was incorrect and unreliable, the recorder was a witness. Um, and I wasn't sure anymore I would ever write a book because I could hardly focus on reading anymore. I wasn't really certainly writing anything towards the book besides keeping a journal. Um, but this idea that maybe one day I would get through this and there would be some sort of record that might prove useful to other people of not just the gaslighting, but just the whole journey I've been on in, in all its complexity and all these different people I'd met who I was recording conversations with. I just thought, okay, maybe this will be useful. Um, and then when I emerged from the sort of wreckage of that experience and was attempting to learn to come back to myself um, through meditation, through therapy, I realized that I wanted to pay forward what so many books had given me during that time period, a sense of feeling seen, of understanding my own experience better. Um, and I also wanted to prove to myself that the things he'd said that I wasn't capable or the ways he diminished my work sometimes as being, oh, what's your work just to write down your feelings. I wanted to show that I knew this would be an incredibly hard thing to do. I wanted to show myself I was capable and I guess um, the world that this was a valid subject for investigative inquiry, um, that interrogating the self is journalism potentially. It's not just a memoir, but that I was doing years of research and interviews um, and living it. And so I just, I felt in the end, like I wanted to make that statement of, you know, why is the personal not only political, but um, a serious for, a topic for serious investigation? And I think you do an incredible job of weaving the research and the journalism throughout your own personal story. Thank you. This makes this to me makes it stand out above of other memoirs. Thanks. Yeah. Did he ever listen to the recording? No. No, he knew I was doing them, but um, he he was very confident, right? And so he was sort of like, I don't have anything to hide. I mean, part of the part of the dynamic of of. Uh, people in this, who kind of exercise these kinds of behaviors, whatever you want to call them, people, psychologists in the book, looking at the transcripts, call it different things, gaslighting, emotional abuse, narcissism, whatever you want to call it. Um, one of the characteristics is you think you're right. And I think one of the points I try to get across is it's not this image we have of gaslighting or manipulation or emotional abuse being something that people get up in the morning and they're like, how am I gonna torture my partner today? And they're plotting it in their minds is really not true. Often what's so confusing is the person is really stuck in their own delusion that they are above delusion, that they are right. And that they don't, that, you know, if only the other person who they love could just see things exactly the way they do and adhere to their worldview and preferences, their partner would be happy. And so when their partner is having difficulty with that, whatever they're doing, um, they turn it around on them and say, that's because you're not being rational. That's because you know, you're know you conditioned by society that way. And they have that sort of in inability to recognize often their own subjectivity uh, and fallibility or to hold the other person's um, anxiety or insecurity with compassion. Um, and that's what kind of fuels the cycle. I don't know. Would you say that's, that's accurate? Did I put that right? <laughs> it does. You said it fantastically, but yeah, I think gaslighting has become this popular term and a lot of people use it correctly. And a lot of people use it way too liberally. Right. And a lot of people 
what they're referring to is just their partner being defensive, not necessarily gaslighting. And I think yes. what's important in what you present is like, look at it. Here's an example. Yeah. And yes. the person is usually not trying to be malicious. They believe things from their own perspective. Yeah. And they're suffering too in their own way. And that's a lot, lot of what I wanted to delve into also in the book, asking psychologists, Buddhist teachers, you know, how can we further the conversation where it's not just about you treating me badly, but holding someone accountable for misbehavior and dissecting that, but also empathizing with and understanding, you know, like what is the suffering on their side that is causing them to um, need to control in this way or need to assert power in this way. Um, and I think that's really important to examine, especially when we talk about, you know, toxic masculinity, how can we understand the ways in which it's a symptom of patriarchy itself and the ways in which men are taught that they're not allowed to have vulnerability and then that, or, you know, fear or sensitivity, that they need to be on top um, and strong in, in those terms. And then that suppressed or disowned uh, fragility or vulnerability gets acted out on other people, often women, um, because they need to assert that they are, you know, like a man, basically, yeah. by, based on this very narrow and restrictive and oppressive definition of um, what a man can be. And yeah, I see in the questions yeah. that people are saying, how do you define gaslighting? Gaslighting is when you make that another person question their perception. Now, yeah, that's a good uh, mm -hmm. definition. One of the quick ones is manipulating someone by psychological means into questioning their sanity. Um, but the trick is sometimes that manipulation is not always conscious on their part. And part of what we talk about of when it's used too liberally is like, it's not the same thing as disagreement. And it's not even something I use to refer to, you know, we might all have moments in an argument where we can slip into these bad behaviors um, once or twice. But if the partner calls you and says, that's, that's not okay what you're doing, are you able to see that and self-reflect and say, oh no, and correct the behavior? And with gaslighting, when it's part of, when it's someone where it's really part of a prolonged pattern of emotional abuse, my experience of it anyways, part of it is um, they cannot admit to that they're doing anything wrong, that yeah. they have the potential to misuse power, or manipulate power. In fact, there's even actually a sort of, um, you know, you see throughout the book, Adam and I are in a dom sub dynamic, but part of the issue of why it gets so unhealthy is that he refuses to acknowledge it as such and kind of actively looks down on consciously eroticized power dynamics like BDSM as people who are just pretending or manipulating others. And that's a big red flag that I point out in the book that other psychologists point out of, you know, ethical practitioners of BDSM say, no, you need to talk about it. You need to acknowledge this, even if you're not exactly. part of BDSM to acknowledge that power dynamics exist in any relationship. And if someone can't even admit to that, that's a big, that's a big red flag because likely again, it has to do with their own, um, you know, disavowal of the fact that they know on some level they're misusing power and power dynamics. And so then that causes them to basically, yeah, right? Like just project and disavow and do all those things. Say, no, that's not what I'm doing. That doesn't exist. Those people are ugly because they feel like they on a certain level don't like it in themselves, but they're not able to consciously explore that or admit to it. Yeah. I feel like I'm dying, but you're the, you're the therapist. No, you're doing great. <laughs> and this is for you. <laughs> So I think with that, because this so much is a story about a relationship that has gaslight, people listening, reading, are going to say, why did you stay so long? Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question and one I explore throughout the book and that I think yeah. because I have these really detailed primary source records, not just audio recordings, but looking back at the journal entries, I view it as really this interesting study of like, how does this happen? 
incrementally um, because you see the red flags early on and you see the pattern getting established early on and how when fights happen, you know, he doesn't respect my space and he'll even like block the door and these other things that seemed very weird to me at the time. And I was like, okay, you know, he's right. We just shouldn't prolong the conflict. We need to handle it. You'd say, you're always running away. Why are you running away? But he couldn't give me any space until it was resolved. And then he'd be very, very sweet afterwards. And then that was the pattern established. And then it would kind of keep escalating. And the mm-hmm. goal for what he wanted would keep moving. And there would be enough respites along the way that I would feel like I was progressing based on his standards. And also the thing that made it very confusing was I was adjusting to my first uh, non-monogamous relationship, which was fraught with jealousy. And I could see how a lot of the times I was acting irrationally um, and the things needed to be deconditioned. I was also in the first, yeah, dom sub power dynamic, but we weren't even able to talk about that. So I had no way to exist outside of it. I was coming into my queerness, mm-hmm. um, being awakened in all these beautiful ways. So it was very confusing of, you know, what what is him being not okay towards me? And I know that. And what is me just needing to decondition all these norms? And it feels like I'm questioning everything. So you know, he's very persuasive and he knows how to suck me back in. Um, And I think the other thing is that, you know, one point I bring up in the book is like some people when they're in these dynamics, it's not because the person is awful to them 24 seven. And that's why it's so confusing. They often are wonderful, even the majority of the time um, in a lot of ways. It's just that the bad behavior gets increasingly often destructive and escalating and your, your condition under those, under those conditions gets increasingly dysfunctional as well. And so, you know, I saw as someone who loved him, the weight of, I guess, him upholding all these masculine norms of always being the strong one, always being the dominant one, never showing vulnerability really. And so when he would show me these moments of vulnerability, um, when he would kind of admit, you know, when he would rest his head on my chest or something, I would feel this immense tenderness of, wow, he doesn't let anyone else see this side of him. And it was so obvious that someone who loved him that he was just, scared deep down and that that was what was fueling so many of these harmful behaviors and so my compassion for that I wanted to just um you know as as the psychologist Terry Real Terrence Real puts it in the book like love up the little boy inside and and he talks about how a lot of um women with men will often do this if they they sort of want to love the disavowed fragility <laughs> with the sort of maternal instinct and they feel that if they could only do that and heal that part of them, all would be well. Um, but the problem is it, it doesn't work that way. If you don't have someone who can work on these things themselves, it's, you can't heal it all from just your own. Uh, right. right. You can't be the source of that healing. They need to be taking responsibility for their own healing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think... Yeah, I think- you highlight really two important hooks that I see that keep people in these dynamics is that when it's good, it's like the best. (laughs) And then it becomes when it's bad, it's like the worst. Right. But this like, wow, I've never had any better. I've never had some of these experiences or levels of experience really can keep us around. Yeah. And I mean, with non-monogamy, you have plenty of opportunity to experience really the highest highs and, and some of the lowest yeah. lows. So yeah, I think it can get extra confusing. Um, and that, you know, I also talk about in the book how, and, and so do you, of how like, I think when people are have more anxious attachment styles or in a dynamic where they feel like they have anxious attachment, that they can confuse that swinging with true love. And we're taught that, yep. you know, love is supposed to be hard. It's supposed to require transformation and be this sort of, um, you know, dramatic quest. And here, this really felt like that because I was really transforming in so many ways 
um, and the highs were very high and the lows were very low. And so on some level, I kind of felt like, okay, maybe this is, this is what love is. This is true mm-hmm. love. And it should, it shouldn't be easy, right? It should, um, that there's this way in which we can sometimes have more difficulty in secure partnerships. If maybe we didn't witness that growing up or because of culture telling us that's not as exciting, recognizing that as true love, because we're like, well, this is too stable and boring. Like I'm not, it's not too feeling, easy. yeah, like excited all the time. Right. And, yeah. and when you have a lot of drama, non-monogamous or monogamous, that fight and make up cycle, well, you know, like jealousy and all these things like activate the amygdala, which is the same part as activating sex. And it's, it's one way that some couples prolong the juice, I think, of those falling in love chemicals, which are going to go away over like two years, you're gonna, you know, the body wants to return to homeostasis. And so like chemically what's happening in the brain is not gonna feel as exciting as that initial total obsession cocktail that we have when we're falling in love. And so sometimes if we fall into something super dramatic and we're feeling like we're gonna lose the person and then we're getting them back and we're fighting and then we're having makeup sex, that's like, I think one way that we like hold on to that high, um, but the it's new relationship energy over time. over time. And of course, yeah. non-monogamous people are trying to maybe pull in new people. And mm-hmm. sometimes when it's healthy, I mean, I don't know if you've seen this. I asked like every sex researcher I talked to and they just don't know there's not research on it. I was like, have non-monogamous people found a way to like hack the system? Like if they're dating someone new and they get those novelty, that new relationship energy chemicals flowing in their brain, can they then superimpose them on their old relationship and feel that again for their partner who they've been with for many years? And they were like, maybe, <laughs> like sounds, sounds plausible. We just don't know. We don't have the research. I mean, do you feel like you see that happening where people are able to- yeah. like, I superimpose it or do they just get confused and obsessed with the one new person and feel like then there must be something wrong with the old person because of that? Yeah, I see a few different things happen yeah, there. Happen it's there. really common for people to open up and a marriage that might have been a little sexless or a little blah revivifies with the opening up. Or there's this new person that comes along, even if they've been open for a while, and it like changes the sexual dynamic in a good way. Like it enhances the pre-existing relationships. I see this a lot. I also see people who get lost in the new relationship energy and their partners are pre-existing ones are angry, rightfully so. So there's a maturing, it's almost a mindfulness process where you start to go, oh, here's the hormones. I see them. I'm going to enjoy them. I'm also not going to get lost in them. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. In just, I want to get into one of the questions that I really loved in the book, how the dynamic that you just talked about, the pursuer and the distancer, the more avoidant, the more anxious in terms of attachment styles. But with the avoidance style, when their anxious partner starts to pull away, then they become the anxious one. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't realize that we have all the styles in us and push us far enough and we'll flip into the opposite. So it was really great to see you portray that. Yeah, totally. And and that was always, that was another thing that kept me too, right? Was it was Mm -hmm. shocking how whenever I would try to leave, which I did several, times (laughs) times <laughs> over you know I tried several several times yeah. um he not only would he become incredibly needy but he would become almost desperate he would you know this otherwise indomitable man would lower himself to his knees and beg me not to leave he would start crying and and you know people who've been in that kind of dynamic they know that's also quite typical where sometimes that that person who's in uh, the position more of the avoidant or who has all the power. And when the other person who's more anxious finally is like, this is not working for me. They just 
totally have a fear of abandonment underneath all this controlling behavior that gets activated and they get really freaked out and they'll do anything to keep the partner from leaving. I mean, it's very typical in, in monogamous, unhealthy dynamics yeah. or abusive dynamics too of like, well, why does the, you know, people ask all the time, like, oh, why do you keep going back? Why do you stay? Well, it's also worth asking why, why is this abusive person keep begging them to stay if they're treating them so poorly so much of the time or don't seem to be very happy themselves? And I think it's, yeah, because of that, they become the anxious in that moment or the whole thing is a, a desire on their part to feel in control. And so yeah. if they lose that, all the surface fear of abandonment or fear of loss of control, it just it's uh it's actually quite fragile and, and close to the surface yeah yeah and on one hand i think it's absolutely genuine from that person that they're in an, sort of an abandonment flare-up and it also works yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. effective at pulling the other person back Definitely. yeah okay. okay let's get to jealousy this was similar to one of my questions martin asked so you read the part of your book where you struggled with jealousy. Do you continue to experience the same challenges? If not, how have you approached this issue? Yeah, I am in a much better place with jealousy. Um, I think, you know, I'm always humble with jealousy where I'm like, I'm never going to say like, oh, I'm better now. Or like now I'm model, you know, polyamorous person because that really annoys me. And, um, but I am in a better place with it. And I think it's because my current primary partner, um, I just feel a lot safer. I feel a lot safer with him. I also think it was non-monogamous from the beginning and I was the one who introduced it and he's less non-monogamously inclined than I am. So I think that when he exercises those freedoms, there's a part of me that's kind of rooting for him because I, don't feel as much like I'm in danger of losing the relationship at any moment, or like if I were to really have an issue with it or something happened in our lives or we need to hit pause, if that would mean I would lose him immediately. So there's just much more of a foundation of feeling um, safe. And also that neither of us treat the jealousy as a, a weakness to be eradicated. So when he's felt jealousy, I can really empathize with it now, having been on the other end so much. And I can hold that as a valid emotion. And we try to like untangle together, you know, what do you need? Do you need some space right now? Do you want to talk about this? What can I do to help you return to a place where you feel safe? Is there anything that can be renegotiated or that would make it, you know, was there a specific trigger here for you? So we just, we talk about it so much more constructively than I think you see me and Adam talking about in the book. Not that Adam and I weren't trying, we definitely were in our own way, but the issue was he was often viewing jealousy as something to eradicate, an unevolved, unloving emotion, um, an immature emotion. And he also couldn't admit to feeling it himself, even though he clearly did, just in a way that was different than me, um, took different forms. And, and so in that kind of dynamic, I felt increasingly insecure, <laughs> which then, you know, because I was feeling these feelings that were supposedly bad and I wasn't supposed to be feeling, so I have to hide it more and I feel shame or I feel unseen and not recognized or heard. And then that makes me more anxious more jealous and then that triggered him being more avoidant or more uh, resentful or resistant to my jealousy or restricting him and pull away more and then I would get more jealous and then we were really stuck in that cycle so yeah I would say the main difference now is that it's a more evenly matched secure dynamic with better communication um I'm sure that I have more experience helps to um because what do you do now when jealousy comes up that maybe you didn't do before? Um, well, I think I hold it with compassion as a legitimate emotion. I also try to like communicate about it. Um, I, it's, you know, I think it's just a less challenging situation. Then that's part of why I don't want to be too 
like, you know, proud about it is just that um, I think because I have more experience with it, because um, I sometimes feel in the relationship that I have more power in the dynamic in certain ways that sort of like Amalia, one of the swingers in the book who has a submissive side like I do, she, you know, her husband Rory is just crazy about her and she just doesn't doubt it. He's just so obviously in for her and she really has that sense of primacy. And so given that, she feels really free to express her kink, which is him being with other women. Um, but part of what makes that so enjoyable for her is that she really trusts, and this is what works for them, that if she were no longer okay with it, it would stop. It would just mm-hmm. stop. And so they really do have that hierarchical model. And me and my partner, while we don't maybe frame it with quite that language, I do feel that similar sense of like, wow, this guy just like, he's really, I just trust his commitment and his loyalty and feel very safe within it and so I think when the jealousy arises I'm more able to enjoy it kind of sometimes or to channel it into that sexual energy or or enjoy the potential feeling of danger all while knowing I'm really safe underneath it I don't actually feel afraid that he's going to run off at any moment or something or that I'm being um yeah, uh, misplaced or, or whatever, that, that sense that I felt often with Adam that made it hard for me to feel secure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it sounds like you're in a situation now where not only do you have compassion for your jealousy, but your jealousy is allowed or not pathologized. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and that it's on on both sides, something that can be acknowledged and talked about, and that there's a commitment to working on ourselves and the relationship, you know? And I think that that was one thing for me with Adam that was off, was that there was maybe a commitment to working on the relationship in certain ways, like we went to couples therapy, but Adam also really felt like, maybe the relationship needed to be fixed or I needed to be fixed, but that he was, he was good. He tried therapy. He was too smart for it. It was kind of his attitude. And I think that's the thing is like, you really need someone who's willing to read the books about it and listen to the podcast, but also like own their own shit and work on themselves and that they view themselves in the relationship as works in progress that they can approach with humility. And I think if you don't, have that and one person is trying to do the bulk of the inner work it gets very hard to work as a couple because it's just it's too uneven right right and I'd say of course that's true whether it's monogamy or non-monogamy but it couldn't be more true in non-monogamy like if you don't want to do your work don't do (laughs) non-monogamy exactly it's gonna explain all the places Yeah, totally. And I think sometimes there's people, I don't know if you see this, but who maybe they've been doing it for longer and they're with a partner who's newer to it, or there's someone who struggles less with jealousy. And so by comparison, they're like, I'm, you know, there can be a certain arrogance that comes along with that sometimes, or um, a certain like, this is the more evolved way to be, right? And I think we have to be really careful with that. Um, whether we be non-monogamous, or kinky, or queer, or anything non-normative, that doesn't inherently make you more evolved. Like, you still have yeah. to work on yourself. And even if you're experienced with non-monogamy, I'm guessing it's something that that's kind of the whole point. You're never going to have to stop working on communication, or it's this ever-changing living organism, and that's potentially what makes it so beautiful. A, a relationship should Ideally, I think always be that, but with non-monogamy, there's kind of, it's just so obviously that because you have more um, shifting factors. And so, yeah, yeah, if you can't kind of be committed to, to, uh, yeah, your part of the, of evolution, then that's a problem. Yeah, I see this a lot where there's one partner who really struggles with jealousy and one who just doesn't have it as much and I just say wait wait 
<laughs> Inevitably, it might be three years later, the non-jealous person, there's something that happens and it's like they're at day one of non-monogamy. And then this partner who's been struggling with it all along has all these skills and capacities. <laughs> it's really fascinating. And they try not to feel smug in that moment. Right. I guess. Yeah. Not like, I told you so. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's why it's been so helpful for me, like, to have been on this other side of things of having experienced so much jealousy. And now I'm in the dynamic where I'm more working with sometimes, I mean, especially more in the beginning, my partner having more of the jealousy and, and maybe empathizing more with, oh, this must have been a little of the frustration Adam was feeling of like, I don't want to be restricted or, or come on, you know, and, but being able to really know what it felt like to be on the other side was so useful because I had so much empathy for it. And I also yeah. remembered what was not helpful, <laughs> you know, what was not helpful to hear and what was helpful to hear. And I found that even though he's a different person and a lot of things that uh, might have been helpful to me or not helpful to him and vice versa, that a lot of the questions I wish Adam had asked me were the same questions. It was useful to ask him in terms of, you know, were there specific triggers here, things that felt bad or things I could do differently? How far in advance would you like to know about things? If I'm wanting to renegotiate, plan, you know, really specific questions of like, not just what would you like, but like, when's the ideal time for me to bring up these things yep. um, so that it doesn't feel like sprung on you? Um, or, you know, do you like to have space when I come back after a date um, or not? Like to really just talk about all these things really specifically and get a sense of his preferences and wherever it's easy for me to accommodate. Sure. Why wouldn't I? Yeah. yeah. I think I do talk about this in my book around rituals and routines, even around the coming and going of dating. Like, what do I need before you leave? What do I need when you come back? What do you need before you go? Yeah. That's really smart. Yeah. And yeah, because it's like, you have so much potential uncertainty and we have so much discomfort with uncertainty. And that's like why it can be so challenging and why all the anxiety can come up. So that makes a lot of sense that you recommend that if anywhere you can build in something dependable <laughs> for right. the person to some, do it. have some ground to stand on, why not? Why wouldn't you do that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I have many more questions. I feel like we could talk for hours, but we have to get to other people's questions. Okay. So this one, this question is for both. Have you been part of or encountered non-monogamous partnerships that were also raising kids and have any insights to how well or not well adjusted those kids were compared to any other style of relationship? I bet you get this question all the time because I'm getting it all the time. Yeah. And oh, and then also, how do you feel about hierarchical polyamory in general? Okay. Two different questions and great ones. Yeah. Do you want to start or you want me to start? Um, I can just say quickly that I think in the book, you don't meet many people with children and that's just part of my own. I'm child free and so, I'm, and I'm in cities and I'm around a lot of other people are. So it's um, probably just a, a circumstance of that was not the people I was dating. It didn't happen to be who I was dating or interacting with. So you don't get that perspective as much, but. I would say that several of the um, swingers I've met in the group, they are parents um, and seem to be doing it very well for a very long time and happily and then have met them doing so, so. Yeah, great. I would recommend looking at Elizabeth Sheff's work. She's the researcher that's done longitudinal studies on polyamorous families and kids. And the big takeaway is the kids are all right. And it's sad in some ways because we had to do this with same-sex parents. Oh, are the kids okay? Yeah, the kids have two adults that love them. They're good. <laughs> and so with the research you showed is that kids are in families with parents who communicate and are very intentional about the love that they have and the relationships they have. 
and the, it trickles down in a positive way to the kids. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. And I think it's also, again, like that's what it's showing on average. And just the same way that we wouldn't say, well, like non-monogamous kid, or monogamous kids, kids from monogamous marriages, how are they turning out? Are they all right? It's like, well, it's going to depend on the way their parents were and right, the situation right. and how happy the parents were. And, um, you know, you say the same thing when your kids have divorced, sometimes it's going to be really damaging. Sometimes that was the better decision or both, you know, it's like, we have to view people as individuals and the dynamics as individuals. And certainly if the parents are happier because of non-monogamy, that's going to be a good thing for the kid. If it's a hot mess, like it was with me and Adam, that's not good, but that's not because we were that wasn't because of that's non-monogamy. Because of our dynamic. So it would have right. been that way if we were monogamous or non-monogamous. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of divorce, the research does show it's not divorce that negatively impacts kids, it's conflict. Yep, so if the sense. divorce is high conflict, yes, that's a problem for the kids. But if a marriage stays together and it's high conflict, it's not the best situation. Yeah. Yep. And I'm raising my child, a seven-year-old in a non-monogamous context, and he's only seven, but by all normative standards, he's securely attached. He knows he's loved. He's got four adults pouring their attention into him. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, that's like great if the kid can have even more parental figures and love in their life. I mean, I think that's one thing I talk about in the book of part of why I think I was naturally inclined towards being open to non-monogamy or, or there's a part of me that it really feels right on a deep level to not just have one partner or one house I'm always at all the time is that my parents divorced when I was two and I went back and forth between their houses and my mom had a new partner from when I was four. So I grew up with my stepdad and my dad seeing them equally. Mm -hmm. And also my uncle who I'm extremely close with and consider another, uh, you know, parental figure in my life. So I really had four, four parents. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, was great. <laughs> like that's, that's a good thing that I have even yeah. more yeah. love and, and examples of love and ways to receive love, you know, because it was all different. Um, but yeah, I do, I do think that's part of why it feels kind of natural to me almost of like, yeah, why would there only be two people? Right. Right. Exactly. exactly. How about hierarchical polyamory? I mean, I think it's all in how people practice it. I think it works really well for a lot of people. You just have to be really thoughtful and very careful about how it's impacting others, um, the secondary partners, especially, you know, or uh, you have couples in a primary relationship who are just so-called unicorn hunting and totally objectifying another person and viewing them as an instrument of their pleasure and nothing more. And um, that's, I guess fine if that's part of that person's kink and you explicitly talk about all of that and they want to be used as an instrument of your pleasure. But, you know, I think where sometimes the hierarchical model gets a bad rep is just people not being totally kind about how they wield that hierarchy or power um, and it ends up hurting others. But I also think um, it's a totally valid uh, model in some way for a lot of people and, and helps them explore non-monogamy in a way that feels secure and doable for them and to expect that everyone's going to practice non-hierarchical polyamory or relationship anarchy I think closes off a lot of the non-monogamous possibilities that could make a lot of people happier in their relationships. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Yeah, and I've seen this interesting swing that hierarchy got a bad rap and so people who are doing it are being more transparent about it and there really are sort of consciously communicating with their other partners and laying things out so people know what they're agreeing to and i see this backlash where there's people who are really denying hierarchy and not kind of claiming the way there's implicit hierarchy all the time yes just time time hierarchy right that yes. alone like yeah i've 
been with this person longer. They know my family. We have holiday rituals. Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely heard about that too, or like prescriptive versus descriptive. Descriptive, I, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think also something I know Kathy Labriola said that she's seen this situation similar to me and Adam, where all of a sudden one person decides they want to be uh, practicing non-hierarchical or relationship anarchy and it gets kind of imposed on the other partner um, or there's sort of this situation where they're kind of using lack of hierarchy as an excuse for mistreatment of one yeah. or more parties saying well you should let me do whatever I want because I don't want because of your insecurities to hurt anyone else that's immoral and you know that's that's bs hierarchy and then what ends up happening is the other person feels like oh i'm not evolved if i don't just let my partner do whatever they want which anyone who is even you know practicing that consciously will say it's not just like a free-for-all of like yay exactly. we're, monarch, oh, we're not gonna like everyone just does whatever they want in any moment and there's no rules it's rather that okay there's not these hierarchies that are prescriptive in advance to the rules but that doesn't mean you just don't care how other people are feeling or that things don't have to be negotiated if you want them to shift um, it's not it's not just like yeah a a label that should be used to kind of mask mistreatment or immaturity exactly I say to people, if you want to do whatever you want, whenever you want, don't be in relationship. Exactly. <laughs> okay, one more question. How have you both managed to not lose your sense of self in multiple partnerships? Great oh, question. It's an interesting yeah. question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel like I struggle with losing my sense of self so much as complicating it like mm. I think it's just the more I'm able to love more than one person at once I see how there's all of these different sides of me and they're all true and it's not like I'm a different person with different people it's just that different aspects of me might come out they might bring out those aspects more fully and so then I think it's just learning to compartmentalize learning to undo the script that is that I'm still working on of like therefore you know if I feel one side of myself that I really love coming out with one partner um, and then with another partner I'm feeling a different side it doesn't mean like those different things are lacking in the other partnership or in competition which which is more important which is the true version of myself but rather like reframing the whole thing of like both these things can be true that one person doesn't have to fulfill all sides of you in fact that's an impossibility and so I think yeah the, the challenge for me has been continuing to learn how to navigate that truth and to undo this expectation no matter how much I might not logically believe it that some magic imaginary person is going to come along and be everything all at once, you know, and that non-monogamy part of why it's so great is that you can get different things from different people. And even with that, it's still not going to be everything. And so how do you hold all of those truths um, and, and not, uh, yeah, not view it as the, competition that society has socialized you to view it as I guess or as some situation where therefore you have to to choose or if you're feeling really excited about one person it must mean someone else is not as compatible as you thought and just kind of that's not true but it's it's so embedded in us so early that you have to keep working I think to learn to be a different way hmm. yeah. I would say for me, I mean, it felt like polyamory really expanded my sense of self. That was very important, but I'm intuiting what the person's getting at with this question. And it can sometimes be like too many cooks in the kitchen, right? Like I have this partner that has these valid needs. I want to meet them. This person is that perspective. Like, where am I in all of this? 
And so sometimes I'll do a practice where I close my eyes and I imagine that everyone's out of the room. I put all my, like the people, the perspectives, <laughs> the cultural and societal stories, like all of it out of the room and just breathe and feel like what's true with me, within me. And that's something that helps. Yeah. But it, it also just the process, which is an ongoing one of secure attachment with self, not just in other relationships. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. If you're not having a clear sense of who you are, it can be easy to get lost in even more people. Exactly. Which I think you see some of that going on with me in the book, trying to untangle those things. <laughs> it can yeah. get quite confusing. Um, yeah. yeah. Right. And internal family systems would be a great modality to support someone in like the multiple selves, the strategies, how to sort through all of that. And I love the polyamorous saying of, you know, love isn't finite, but time is. Yeah. And I think acknowledging that reality of, yeah, maybe you do get into a situation where it's like, I'm just, I don't have time to uh, have this many partners and then you have to reevaluate. And that is a, a possibility. It doesn't mean that you can't love that many people. In fact, I feel like I could probably love an infinite amount of people. The more I love, the easier it feels to love personally. Yeah. So it is a matter of figuring out then, given the finite nature of time and life, how do you want to prioritize? How do you want to move forward? And that's going to, I think, always be shifting and different for everyone. Yeah. yeah. I wish I knew who to quote that to. I know, right? It's it's like thrown around a lot, but who said it first? Right. I Gosh. use it in my book, but there's no one to connect. really. Yeah. Interesting. That's yeah. Interesting. When I talk about polysaturation. Okay, I think we're at time. Yeah. Oh, it's went so fast. Thank you I know. for hanging in so long. This is great. Thank you all so much for coming. Thanks for bearing bearing with us with the mm -hmm tech difficulties. It worked out. We got through it. Um, and yeah, just a reminder to buy the book if, books if you haven't yet. Um, and to check out our other events. And thank you all uh, so much for coming. And um, yeah, a lot of a lot of interesting things to think about um, that I know I'm still like thinking of uh, after this conversation. And um, I, I wish you both luck on, on your future future projects and such. Oh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Jessica. Um, and thank you, yeah, to Women and Children First. And if anyone wants to reach out to me, they can follow me on Instagram or Twitter at my name, Rachel Krantz. And I, I love hearing from people, especially if you've read the book and it's meant something to you. Those messages really uh, keep me going. So thank you. Bye. All right. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night.